Good morning, everyone. Good to see you all and welcome to worship this morning. All of you. Last week was Pentecost, the day where we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. But let's not uh, make the mistake of thinking, well, it was just last week. Uh, every Sunday, as people gather together, we need to be open to God's Spirit moving among us. So, remaining seated, we're going to sing through a couple of times, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. If you're not familiar, you'll hear once how it goes, and then we'll sing it through. But remember, it's a prayer. Every bit as much as a song, it's a prayer that we can say together, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. to sing together Spirit of Truth and Grace. Uh, wonderful words written by a minister down in Lanark, Church of Scotland minister in Lanark, Ian Cunningham. Spirit of Truth and Grace, come to us in this place as now in Jesus' name God's people gather. Let's stand together. We'll sing Spirit of Truth and Grace.
Friends, within the Presbyterian Church, we don't so much recognise saints' days, but let me tell you nonetheless, yesterday was St. Barnabas' Day. St. Barnabas' Day, of course, in the New Testament, Barnabas was the encourager. He who encouraged. So what I'd like to do with people around about you now, can you think of someone who in your life encouraged you? Maybe very generally or maybe within the Christian faith. Somebody who encouraged you in your journey through life. So turn to your neighbors and reflect on someone who to you was a Barnabas, an encourager. Well, perhaps those who have encouraged us are those we want to give thanks for. Now, the second thing to consider is this. This morning uh, in my devotional, um, I came across this phrase. It said that the purpose of Sabbath, which for we Christians is a Sunday, is that stillness might give way to thankfulness. That as we are still before God, thankfulness might bubble up within us. So again with a neighbor or people at your table, what is it most of all that you would give thanks for today? Something that's happened in this week or just something generally in your life? Turn to your neighbors and share together, what are you thankful for as you're sat here this morning? I want to combine both of those things now, the encouragement and the thankfulness. 
I'll tell you what encourages me almost more than anything that I know there are people praying for me. Uh, people tell me as much that we're praying for you, Martin, regularly as our minister, and that is both an encouragement to me and something for which I'm very thankful for. And I wonder if we might share that this morning. On your tables, there's a small piece of paper, one for, enough for one for everybody at your table. And what I would like you to do is write the names of the people who are at your table this morning. Now, some of you, there are eight around the table, some of you just two or three. And if you don't know the names of some of the people at your table, here's a wonderful opportunity for you to say hello and to actually learn some more names. Write down the names of those who are at your table today. And I'll tell you why in a wee moment. And of course, there are some children here, make sure their names are included. Now, if you're at a table and there's only two or three of you, you could add some other names of people around about if you wanted to. Everybody got all the names down? Well, friends, your challenge this week, this week is to pray for the people on your list. If there's only one other person, then that person's going to be showered in prayer all week. If there are eight people at your table, you've got all days this week plus an extra day. But I think it would be an encouragement for all of us, as it is for me, to know that there are folks praying for us. So take your little piece of paper home with you after service today and pray for the people on that list through all the days of this week. Shall we bow our heads now and together shall we pray. Father God, we thank you for Barnabases, those who encourage us in life generally and in the Christian walk particularly. There is so much that we have to be thankful for, and not least that we are in a church family. And so make us faithful to pray one for another all through the days of the week and beyond. Help us to be open to meet new people and to make new friends within our church family that we might share the journey of faith together. And as we think of that for which we have to be thankful, most of all, Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Spirit and that you love us, each and every one of us, no matter who we are, where we've come from, what our background is, or what we have done in life. You love us, always have, and always will. And for this truth, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're going to sing again, thanking God for the love that is unconditional. There's nothing, nothing I can do or say that will make God love me more. So we'll stand together as the band takes the place, and we'll sing, there's nothing, nothing I can do or say. There's nothing 
be seated. Friends, this part of, first part of the service, we've been um, conversing at our tables, but for the next part of our service, we will be very much giving attention to the front. So if you're seated in such a way, now's maybe the time just to reorientate your chair if you are more comfortable doing that. Before our children go through for what is planned for them this morning, uh, one or two notices. Uh, first of all, um, last week I mentioned the Tuesday night girls group, which is going like a bomb, uh, going like a, a fair. It really is tremendously uh, encouraging how many girls are coming to that. We asked for, uh, could there be extra volunteers to help? We got one last week, which was great, but bear in mind it could be you. There are many roles within that group, uh, and some extra volunteers would really help. That is Tuesday evenings. It will stop for the summer uh, and then resume when the, the schools go back. Our Wednesday mornings are back up and running, of course. There's coffee from half past nine. You can drift in and enjoy coffee, even if you're not then staying for the service at half past ten. But of course, you could combine both if you wanted. I did mention also last week that our Holy Land pilgrimage is going ahead. We leave on the 7th of October. Uh, very much looking forward to it. Uh, there are spaces. If MD's thinking, gosh, you know, I've never done that uh, and would like to, then speak to me afterwards and I can help you out with information. Um, the Delizio Project, of course, which um, leads the work in Malawi, they have their 15 year anniversary and celebration Friday evening in the bowling club up at the top of Dishland Town Street. Uh, doors open at 7 uh, and it will all get going at 7.30. So tea and coffee and so on from 7 and the event itself from 7.30. It's going to be a great night giving thanks for everything that's been achieved in those 15 years since the first group went there. Um, friends, I wonder if you are aware, but there seems to be slight increases in COVID numbers that I'm hearing about again. Uh, we hope and pray that that will not become anything like a new spike. But again, one needs to be a little wary. Uh, and if you're happier with a mask on in church, do it. Wear your mask. Even if you no one much else is, if you want to, you can. If you would much prefer to be in a sort of isolated space, then again, fine. You will always be able to find a space in the church where you are sm slightly more socially distanced. And you can, of course, do, as I did this morning, take a test, a negative. And so, we need to be wary. As I say, we hope and pray that there will not be a major upsurge, but we are mindful and cautious nonetheless. Friends, I want to tell you, I'm so sad to announce that, that one of our men, William Walker, died on Monday at this week. I'm not sure everybody knows who I mean by William, but very, very faithfully, he sat in that corner for many years, actually. It started like this, Pat Mill, where's, where's Pat got to this morning? She's in the back corner. Pat invited William to our Alpha course many years ago, and he said yes. And uh, he came to Alpha, started coming to church, and virtually never missed a Sunday after that, until he took quite seriously ill a few years ago, then came COVID, uh, and I've kept in touch with William, but he's not been able to be back. And then his illness took a very serious downturn on Friday of last week, and he died in Nine Wells on Monday. I was able to go there uh, and be with him uh, in those final hours. William's funeral service, through which we'll give thanks for his life, is this coming Friday, and um, the details are in the press uh, at George Stewart's. We will give thanks for William. Please remember his family. He has two sons uh, and their associated families. Today, though, we say for William Walker, thanks be to God. Our children are going to go through. They've got all sorts of plans uh, in the small halls, and we will continue here in the church. Jenny will come forward. She's reading Scripture. Looking for her. Oh, yes, she's already here. 
Um, we continue, of course, in our journey through Paul's letter to the Colossians. We are in the second part of chapter 3 and reading from verse 18. So, yes, Colossians chapter 3 and verse 18, as we hear together today the word of the Lord. Wives, submit to your husbands, for that is what you should do as Christians. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, it is your Christian duty to obey your parents always, for that is what pleases God. Parents, do not irritate your children or they will become discouraged. Slaves, obey your human masters in all things, not only when they are watching you because, they want to gain, because you want to gain their approval, but do it with a sincere heart because of your reverence for the Lord. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as though you were working for the Lord and not for human beings. Remember that the Lord will give you as a reward what he has kept for his people. For Christ is the real master you serve, and wrongdoers will be repaid for the wrong things they do, because God judges everyone by the same standard. Masters, be fair and just in the way you treat your slaves. Remember that you too have a master in heaven. Amen. Thank you, Jenny, and thanks be to God for his word. Well, Colossians starts with theory, we might put it that way, who Jesus is, what Jesus did, why Jesus matters, and then it moves to the practical we considered, to started to consider that last week, that we are called to live lives worthy of the Lord. And pleasing to him in every way. Folks, that's your wake-up call every morning. That's what you're called to, to live a life worthy of the Lord. Well, today, we're going to move on to some of the detail of what that living might look like on a day-to-day -day basis. And as we see right from the get-go, the letter focuses on relationships and principally relationships within the family circle and so on. The brilliant New Testament scholar, N.T. Wright. Do you know, I've known him for years and yesterday was the first time it dawned on me. His initials are N.T. and he teaches the New Testament, N.T. It was meant to be, obviously. He wrote this, it is clear from the New Testament that the early church took seriously the necessity of living out Christian faith in the place where, for better or for worse, one is truly oneself. What he's saying is this, that it's quite possible to be Christian in public when folks are there and watching, but what about at home? Christian living begins in the day-to-day -day mundanity of the home. And as we engage with those nearest to us in our everyday circles, some people might say, but why do we need instructions about that? Shouldn't it come naturally? Well, the equally brilliant C.S. Lewis put it this way. Louise, can you jump onto the next slide? Thank you. The home must be a place of rules. The alternative is not freedom, but the tyranny of the most selfish member. Now that's C.S. Lewis, and I think that is brilliantly insightful. So of course, Christians have obligations to act ethically, to be engaged in the world charitably, and to behave honestly in our working lives and so on. But where the rubber first hits the road is how we interact with loved ones, those who are closest to us. That's where Christian living starts. That's where we begin this business of living a life worthy of the Lord and seeking to please Him in all we do. And friends, in that regard, as with so much else in Scripture, our starting point should be to examine ourselves 
rather than critiquing others. I said before, use a mirror to look at yourself before you even think about picking up a magnifying glass to peer at others. In the message version of the New Testament, the second line of today's passage says this, Husbands, go all out in love for your wives. I love that phrase. Go all out in love for your wives. Well, I can tell you, when I read that, I'm not thinking about anybody else in the whole world other than myself and the way in which that verse calls me to live. So I'm thinking, have I been all out for Elaine? And if not, why not? And if not, what need I do about it? And those of you other men who are married, ask yourselves, Have you been going all out for your wives? This is what I mean by saying that the teaching here, it starts at home and with people around us about us. So today's passage deals with our relationships. But before we look in more detail at those, I want to talk through a couple of general points. Firstly, that the list of topics and situations dealt with in this letter is not exhaustive. Clearly, no one passage or even one letter can cover all the bases. There's nothing here, for example, about single people or childless couples or widowed or orphaned people. He just deals with husbands and wives, parents and children. But don't think for one moment that those other groups of people are less important. Jesus himself was single. In God's sight, everyone matters equally so. So to reiterate, the list of topics here is not exhaustive. The letter was written to deal with particular circumstances, not every circumstance. So I don't want anybody sat here today thinking, well, it it doesn't apply to me. Do I matter less? No, you don't. The second general introductory point is this. We need to be able to make a clear distinction between what are timeless biblical truths and those pieces of guidance which were offered in the light of the norms of the day, and therefore which are not going to apply today, at least not in the same way. So, for example, here in the letter, we find reference to the owning of slaves. I'm assuming that none of us here is in that position. Look, Paul offers advice to slave owners as to how they are to treat their slaves and to slaves about how they should work for their masters and so on. But folks, you see, the question that arises is this, why didn't Paul condemn slavery? Why didn't he call for its abolition? Why didn't he instruct slave owners to liberate your slaves, free them now? Some people even read scriptures and and want to have nothing to do with them because they take it to mean that the Bible justifies slavery. Well, of course it does not. Slavery is an abomination, an evil of the first order. We need to realize, therefore, that what we have when we read the letter to the Colossians is a window into another world in which slave owning was the norm. The idea back then of abolition of slavery would have been beyond anybody's ability to imagine. You might as well have asked them to imagine the internet 
Of course, it couldn't have been done. So these letters come to us from the way things were. The instructions are, we might say, wrapped up in the culture of the day, and therefore great care is needed when it comes to reading them and interpreting them for our day. I know it's very easy for people to say, but it says it in the Bible. Yes, but we don't live 2,000 years ago in the Asian part of the Roman Empire. We need to pick our way carefully through these letters and distinguish between what is being described and what is being taught. These two are different. Now, you know today, there are still being people, still people being trafficked across our world, modern day slavery. Is anyone going to say that that's okay on the grounds that in the letter to the Colossians, Paul gives instructions to slave owners? Of course we're not. So we read discerning, looking for lessons that are applicable now and not exactly as it was then. So, we don't see everything in these passages as instructional, but neither should we dismiss them out of hand. We believe that all Scripture is useful, and so our job is to look for the lessons and to ask, how can we apply these lessons to our world today? So, back to the slavery example. Most Christian commentators agree the best way to handle these verses is to apply them to the modern day workplace. So those of you who have jobs, the teaching for you is clear. Work hard, work honestly, and give it your best shot, even when you are not being supervised. Maybe that's even more important in these days of working from home. It says, written by Paul, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Now there's your instruction for nine o'clock tomorrow morning, or whenever it is, you might be back at work. And if you're a boss, or a manager, or a gaffer, or a supervisor, treat your workers considerately, be fair with them. When taken together, these instructions give us the foundations for the workplace, and one wonders how much things would improve in terms of industrial relations if management and unions embraced the values that Paul gives. So do you see, the passage was originally written into a context of slavery, but we can take the lessons strip them out of the ancient world and apply them to our world. That is the job of Bible reading and interpreting and applying. Now we come to the very first line. Wives, submit yourselves to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Submit yourselves to your husbands. Well, well, here is a verse that absolutely requires careful handling. The word submit is so loaded with meaning. I mean, what would be, what's the first thing that pops into your head? I'll tell you what it is for me. I think of wrestling matches. Um, and when one wrestler wears the other one down to the point that he shouts out, I submit, I submit. Heaven forbid that a marriage should be built on that kind of dynamic. And heaven forbid that there is one single married man here today who imagines that this verse gives permission to coerce or manipulate, or force, or demand, or require, or dominate, or in any way lord it over his wife. 
or rule over her. Of course, we see that in other cultures. The coming to power again of the Taliban in Afghanistan, one might say has been a disaster all round, but particularly so perhaps for women once more denied access to education, once more almost shut away, downtrodden and denied the right to live and to express themselves. Heaven forbid that we see anything of that in the Christian world because we take hold of that word submit and misapply it. And what about the abuse of women that comes on the back of the misuse of the word submit? Monsters like Harvey Weinstein, who, who so abused his power on the casting couch to sexually abuse untold numbers of women. Monsters like Jeffrey Epstein and his associates, and I'll say no more about that, who trafficked young women from all over the world for his own sexual gratification. All of that comes out of misuse of the word submit. Now, of course, these cases come to the light in the news and so on, but much of the abuse is carried on behind closed doors and will never feature in the news. And it's happening in houses near to you and the victims and perpetrators are people known to you. Sometimes it's violent, sometimes it's psychological. Always it's an expression of you will submit to me. Why do you think recently I led the beginnings of a local campaign to tackle violence against women? Because I'm Christian. Because I read and understand the message of Scripture. And because sometimes you have to do something. We are called to do something. In terms of that abuse, Flee from such inhumanity. Flee from such unchristian behavior. Behavior. Flee from any understanding that sees a woman as even that much less than a man. That is not scriptural. Instead, understand that in setting his pieces of advice in couplets that Paul is saying that husband and wife have complementary but equal responsibilities. And yes, though his language owes something to his first century setting, in truth, he was breaking all the conventions of the day by giving women a place at all. But he expresses the fullness of the Christian position on this matter in his letter to the Galatians, where he writes that there is neither male nor female, for all are one in Christ. And also in that passage, incidentally, he says, there is neither slave nor free, for all are one in Christ. And there you have the wonderful truth of the gospel, of the new way of living to which Christ calls us. Do you know the church has been somewhat complicit in some of this? Despite the fact that it was women who stayed with Jesus to the end as he hung on the cross, despite the fact that it was women who were the first to testify to the resurrection, very quickly the early church airbrushed women out of the story and denied them rightful roles, relegating them to what we might say scone makers and dishwashers, or whatever that was all those centuries ago. Certainly, leadership was denied them, again, from misreadings of what Paul has written in some of his letters. Now, the Catholic Church, for example, still does so, but it was only 50 years ago that the Church of Scotland ordained women to leadership positions, firstly as elders and then as ministers. 
But talking of women in leadership, I had a conversation this week with my friend Tommy McNeil, minister at Martin's Memorial in Stornoway. He has just led his church through a dramatic change. That is, they have just ordained women as elders for the first time ever. Such a thing was previously unthinkable on the islands, where of course there is a deeper conservatism about much of life. And many across the Hebrides will be shocked at what has happened in Martin's Memorial Church. Some may want nothing more to do with Tommy or his church. Some will accuse him of, some have accused him of selling out to the modern world, giving up in the Bible and so on. But his leadership team has grown in its understanding and now believes that the time absolutely is right. They have freed themselves from such a narrow reading of Scripture and I hugely admire Tommy's courage in leading this change. From some quarters, he will face considerable criticism. But he's doing the right thing. And he's had my encouragement for sure. You know, friends, much changes through the years. Women elders on the island of Lewis, I never thought I would live to see the day. But it's quite possible that those things which are first seen as selling out to the modern world actually, and in truth, owe more to a greater understanding of who God is and of how God is calling us under the rightful place of all God's people. I'm going to suggest that we'll see many more ways in the coming days in which previous understandings will begin to crumble a little. We should watch with interest. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Father, fathers, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. Incidentally, in the Greek, the word here translated Fathers can mean both parents, so you would have to take your pick. I think it certainly doesn't mean that the discipline of children belongs only to fathers. I think it's a shared role as everything else in the home. And on and on the advice goes about how we live together as people and how our relationship should be. And notice it's always complementary, always ensuring the rights and responsibilities of both parties. And though it seems obvious enough for us today, it's hard to overstate how radical this was in its day, that children would be given some sort of role here, some sort of protection almost as it were, that women would be included in this teaching. Well, in many ways, perhaps, the teaching about how to follow Jesus is still radical. It's still an exciting way of life to be called into. Those of us who would aim to live lives worthy of the Lord and to please Him in all that we do. It starts with those nearest and dearest to you. So whoever they are, go and do it. Amen. And may God bless to us the reading and reflecting upon his word. Amen. Before our closing praise, we're going to pray into the world. Various things are in my mind. Yesterday, here in our town, there was a, a remembering of 40 years since the Falklands conflict, uh, and something like 400 uh, Marines who served there were gathered in our broth yesterday. Many remembering colleagues, comrades lost. 
I'm also very mindful yesterday in the United States there were many um, demonstrations and protests about the ongoing horror of gun violence, which for those of us in another context just seems incredible that no changes are forthcoming. But let us remember so many who were children in school shot dead in both in New England and in Texas just in recent weeks. Yesterday I saw in the news that a man had gone into the sea in Wales uh, to try to rescue two children who had got into trouble by a, a riptide current. He saved the two kids, but he died. Not his children, he saved two other kids, and his life was lost. He drowned. So much mourning there. And then I suppose nearer to home and somewhat less dramatic, but remember we're called to pray for one another. Uh, Chris messaged me this morning to say that him and Lisa Marie would not be in church. They weren't here last week and again today. Lisa Marie has been really poorly. Uh, and he said he was up with her all night last night. Uh, she is quite ill. So let's pray for Lisa Marie. We, we baptized her here just a few weeks ago, and it's our responsibility to be in a church, to pray for our number. No doubt there are a hundred other things as well, but let us focus there this morning. Shall we pray? Lord, we remember back many of us who are old enough to remember vividly to the Falklands conflict and the loss of life. We pray today for servicemen and women who were there, who lost comrades, and who are themselves scarred for life, inside and out. And of course, with conflict in our minds because of that, we are aware that conflict continues to rage in Ukraine. Oh, Lord, for a breakthrough, we pray. For a breakthrough in terms of peace negotiations, we pray, hear us, Lord. And for a day, Lord, in the United States, when young men or otherwise will be prevented from bursting into schools and indiscriminately taking young lives, we pray for lawmakers there, Lord, for progress. Today we remember the family of the man in Wales whose life was lost in saving children. Bless them, Lord, in their bereavement. And may there be a degree of comfort in knowing how selflessly he spent his final moments. Lord, we pray for Lisa Marie that she might be well again very soon and back with us in church. And the same for all those of our family and those known to us who are unwell at this time. Your healing, Lord, and for it we pray. These are our prayers. We ask them in Christ's name. Amen. So remember, prayers are a lifetime calling and not a Sunday morning occupation. So take these little pieces of paper away with you today and be praying through the week for these names and for other situations as they arise. And we'll pray because we have a God who is good and who hears us as we pray and who responds according to his good will and purpose. So we'll stand and sing about the goodness of God.
out into the world now, remembering that just as in days gone by, so now God is calling us to serve Him in these days. We sing together the days of Elijah. And as you go, may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you all and remain with you today and forevermore. Amen. Friends, please be seated. A couple of extra things just to announce to you. Uh, last Sunday, we had a wonderful afternoon. The sun shone brightly. There was just enough breeze for uh, our kites to fly uh, above Victoria Park, and it was warm and everything we would have expected. Uh, I'm glad it was last week rather than today. It's a little cooler, although the kites might have been even more exercised on a day like today. Next Sunday will be our, uh, our trip, and it has to be reiterated a hundred times over. It's for anybody and everybody. Not just any sense, oh, is that for, for children? No, it's for anybody who would like to come. And we're going to go to Edsel uh, and to the, the park area there around about the church at Edsel. And uh, it will be a case of the same as last week. You just bring a picnic or whatever else you want to have with you. And, you know, most important, it's a wonderful way of us sharing together in the fellowship of the church. Yes, hopefully with lots of our children able to come and be with us, but for all of us, church family. So that's next Sunday, and we'll more or less leave after the end of the service and go to Edsel for that trip. So that's to look forward to. Much more immediately, there is a big-scale concert uh, in here this afternoon. It's the Children's Music School of Angus. Uh, and so 
between things going on here and things going on there, we are going to not collapse them, but literally lift our tables through to the hall for use there. So, once you are done this morning, what I'm going to ask is that uh, there would be a, a, a number of people who would be able to help us do that. Uh, it will take 10 minutes, literally, maximum with uh, the sufficient help. Uh, but if you are staying around to chat, and I always encourage that, then it would be good if you would sort of move out the way, to, to put it bluntly, whether that's to come to the front or the corner or, or the gallery or the doorstep outside, and that will let the, the activities that need to be done got on with. Friends, I've enjoyed being with you folk this morning. I mean, amongst everything else at churches, it is good to be together, and thank you for coming. And thank you for being part of worship. But it doesn't stop here, does it? It's how we live our lives, so go and do it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.